Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Barn Week. It's day four. Um, and uh, as I, I mentioned, the feel free to introduce yourself and chat with each other in the chat box and then use the question and answer box for um, for questions about the content. And we'll definitely have time to get to those after the presentation today. Um, welcome back uh, for all those of you who have joined with us. Uh, throughout the week. We're, we're really thrilled with the reception of Barn Week and how this has all been going. We've gotten a lot of great feedback. I'm uh, Jennifer or Jay Mortensen. I work with the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation and we are Washington's only statewide nonprofit advocacy organization and we work to build a collective ethic that preserves historic places through education, collaboration, stewardship, and we are dedicated to saving the places that matter in Washington uh, and building, supporting, and sustaining communities through historic preservation. So for, for the past 13 years, the Washington Trust uh, has been honored to manage the Heritage Barn Grant Program, which is a program of the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation. And, um, and so we've We've been kind of all things barns <laughs> for the last 13 years, um, which is, is uh, why uh, we've um, <laughs> initiated this, this week of, of barn, barn celebration. So if you're wondering kind of where this all started, um, it's uh, Barn Week was created through funding from the US Fish and Wildlife Service as mitigation for a, a historic barn that needed to be dismantled on their property. So the salvage barn materials were repurposed in other projects um, and then the US Fish and Wildlife provided funding for us to create this week of learning, celebration and fun uh, all about historic barns. And if you watch yesterday's presentation of barn rehabs with uh, myself and Chris Moore, he did, uh, Chris went over some of those really great projects that use some of that salvage material. So you might be interested in checking, checking that out. So um, today we are wrapping up barn week. Um, but don't let the fun stop. We've got other trivia and features on all of our social feeds. So uh, use the hashtag Barn Week uh, to share, share your own stories and photos and tag us at Preserve Wa um, on all the platforms uh, to kind of get involved and, and have fun. We'd love to share your content as well. Um, and then participate in the trivia and, and other fun stuff with Harrison's uh, Barnagram postcards are our um, trivia prizes. So if you are able to answer those correctly, we'll 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 send those out to you, and they're really really fun. So a couple of quick tech notes before we begin. Um, all attendees are in listen and watch mode only. But as I said, feel free to use the chat, use the Q and A box, um, and then if if you're in, tuning in on Facebook Live, go ahead and put your comments there, and they'll get uh, communicated to us over here in Zoom. And we'll be recording this uh, session and posting it afterwards. So uh, if you wanted to share it or come back to it later, um, you'll have access to it uh, through, through YouTube. And um, another thing I wanted to mention is if you wanna keep in touch with us and all things barns and preservation, we do have an email list and I, uh, I think Alex will throw that email, it's already in the, already in the chat, um, to sign up for notifications about grants, salvage materials. This is our email list that we send all our barn stuff to. So sign up on that email list um, to stay connected and learn more about barns. So I think we'll get started and Alex is gonna share screen here and get our slides going. Great. All right, so you're here at Barn Week with our Barn Preservation Virtual Field School with uh, Dr. Harrison Goodall and my, myself as host and Harrison as the, as the expert. Um, we'll just go ahead and go to the next slide, Alex. So we're here today and we have the wonderful opportunity to tour these two uh, beautiful historic barns uh, at the Billy Frank Jr. National um, uh, Wildlife Res Refuge, um, which is also owned by U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So wanted to give them a thanks for letting us uh, tour these barns. So Harrison and I went out about a week ago and filmed an on-site tour of these barns. And um, just kind of, we walked all around and Harrison is going to show us kind of all the features um, of, of the barn, 
how they uh, sometimes deteriorate, how to manage that, and, and kind of things to look for in historic barns. So we're just going to go ahead and um, play the video. As, as I mentioned, it's pre-recorded. Um, it's, and then afterward, um, we'll have time for Q&A. So as the question comes up, as the questions come up, go ahead and throw them in the in the Q and A, and we'll be monitoring that. And then afterward, we'll have a conversation with um, with Harrison. So, I'll we'll just get the uh, video rolling. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Harrison Goodall. And I hope you can hear me through all of this uh, business right through here. And we're going to make it happen. All right. And actually, I am in awe of these spectacular buildings. They are absolute monuments for the state of Washington and anywhere, quite frankly. They are so wonderful. I may not even know where to begin because of the size, because of the significance of them. Uh, because of uh, the details, because of the architecture, because of the stories that are behind the barns and the farms that are surrounding it. And having them sit on a refuge is just another layer of all of that. So um, what, uh, what we're probably going to be doing here is talking about what happens with barns, what are their needs, what's going on with them, the way I look at a building is that I start from the top and I work my way down. And um, uh, because that's the way that water runs off and you will uh, probably be obvious, it'll be obvious to you that I'm talking about water a lot because water is the enemy. And essentially, there are a lot of things that causes a barn, a building to degrade, but much of it is because of the moisture that's surrounding it. So we'll talk about that. And, and, and as you will see, I'll try to point out some of those moisture issues uh, or water issues or how that's affecting things. We won't be able to get into too much of the details of what to do about that but maybe that's another time or something that you should think about of how we're going to tackle that with your barn or your situation. That's right, Paul Harrison, he's the expert. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start out at the top. And that top would be the cupolas that are sitting up on top. Not many barns these days have cupolas or uh, barns of this magnificent will have because ventilation is such an important thing. What concerns me about these is that I can't see what they, what's going on. And uh, for that, um, I really ought to have some binoculars to look at every piece and part of, the, of what I can see from here and it's not possible even to look at that from the insides. So what I would do typically is just comb every bit of the cupolas and of the roof surface. And um, what I'm looking for are a couple things. I'm looking to see is that roof covering, whether it's shingles, shakes, metal, uh, is it at the end of its life cycle? Has it, is, is it, is it beyond saving and it needs a, a, a replacement issue at that time? So I'm looking for that, but I'm also looking to see if there are any gaps, any openings, particularly with metal roofs, that once the wind wants to chatter it and open it up and have openings in it. So my concern is, once again, with leaks, with water penetration into the inside. That will be a highest priority. One of the highest priorities when I'm looking at a barn is water penetration into the roof. I'm, I'm particularly looking for around the edges of the roof also to see if the flashing is 
malfunctioning or what I often find is that on, on barns that are either a gable roof or a shed roof is that at the very edge of the roof, the roof edge, the water, here, here's the roof, the water wants to come down and wrap itself around and start wetting whatever's underneath in here and wetness then equals decay, essentially, in simplicity. So the roof covering is one thing of whether that needs replacement or repair and that's something that should be done right away. Something else that I'm looking at is the condition of the structural condition of the roof. A little difficult to tell on a gothic arch roof, but on a gambrel roof, a gable roof, a shed roof, there are a couple things that happen to it. One of the things that happens is that, like this piece of paper, it wants to push out. So over time, over time, it wants to push out the roof in the center, not on this particular barn, but most barns, that's going to happen that way. And it's going to push out. And so I'm looking along the edge, the lower edge of the roof, to see if it's bowed out. I'm also looking to see whether on a gable roof, on a gable roof, whether there is a pocket, if you will, a relaxing of the rafters over time that will just start to give a belly in, to, the, to this panel of a roof. So using that as an example, uh, let's look along the edge of this roof. So uh, I, on this barn, I don't see an issue or a concern, but it's something that I'm looking at in barns I'm looking to see what's going on. Is there a separation? And what I mean by that is that if it's a gable type of kind of a roof, that as the roof ridge comes down, I'm looking for that also as well. As the roof ridge comes down because it wants to settle, it's pushing the edge out bowing the outside of the of the roof and in some cases actually pushing the walls outward. So I'm looking at that just to give me an idea of when I go inside what am I really looking at structure wise with the barn structure. The other thing that uh, I, I keep concerning myself with structure and so I carry my iPad around with me and so I want to know Really, what's going on with the barn? A lot of barns, I find, are in wind, windy positions, windy areas where, uh, it, well, look at this, it's 90 degrees. Uh, but when I start getting uh, walls and posts and columns and door jams uh, that are at an angle, then I want to get a pattern of what's going on with the whole barn and to have some understanding of how to be able to deal with that. In some cases, it may mean that we ought to think about maybe cabling the building in such a way so that it doesn't get any worse. The likelihood of it coming back to plumb again is not going to happen. All right, let's take a look at the, the walls. What's, what's happening here, uh, what happens with all of these barns, is that the, the siding is meant to keep the water away from the interior. So it gets then wetted. Wood wants to expand and contract. Sun wants to shine on it and start eating away the lignin, the soft part of the wood, leaving the cellulose still intact. Um, as will happen here, and we'll look up close of one of those situations. Uh, the siding wants to come off and, and pop and deteriorate. 
the area of primary concern is not with these barns, but with most barns, the wood goes down to the grade, goes down to ground level. These barns are so magnificent in that when they were built in 1932, they built a foundation four feet high or so all the way around the base of the building, not only protecting it uh, from deterioration on the exterior, but also because these were dairy barns and a lot of poops going on inside, uh, that deterioration will just eat out a barn really fast. And some of the earlier barns that ev even have wood plank flooring, oh boy, <laughs> oh boy, is that a problem there? So we all know what decay looks like and we all know what weathering looks like, but essentially, uh, if I hate to say it, but if you see a barn, you see decay. It's just going to happen, and uh, it's something that we need to be concerned about, maybe not immediately, but to be aware of where that deterioration is and what its impact is going to be into the future. I have to say, when I'm looking at barns, I'm thinking not only of what is happening now, but when I see a problem I'm thinking, what is the life cycle? What's the life of that before it starts affecting other parts of the building? Maybe it's already, maybe it's an immediate thing that has to be dealt with. Or maybe it's something that if we don't do something in the next 10 years, five years, one year, then it's gonna create a real monster of an issue. And with heritage barns, that's a real significant thing because we're trying to retain the character of that barn and not let it affect other parts of it. Obviously, here, uh, the, the paint is gone, the finish is gone, and that is what's allowing the UV to start degrading the siding itself. Uh, it's also allowing some of this mold to, uh, to occur. It would be nice, yes, that it be painted back in again, that's an issue that I would say is high on the list here, is painting, um, but that's not a small task, nor is it an inexpensive task along the way. I can't say that this is typical, but it's an example of what's happening with wood, is that it's just splitting, deteriorating, nails are popping, it's losing its connection to the walls, something that needs to be dealt with along the way. Okay, another issue, might be for some anyway, are birds, bats, and other critters that might want to be attacking the building. For the most part, leave them alone. <laughs> uh, and if it looks like they're making some impact on the building, then start learning a bit more about how to be able to deal with that issue without eliminating the varmint or the critter or the bird or the pest that's doing that. Now, I'll come back a little bit later on and talk about insects. <laughs> I, I don't have the same love for insects as I do for birds and other critters, right? <laughs> so we'll talk about insects a, a, a little bit later. With just about every barn, no matter what kind of roof it has, the concern that I have is what's going on when water runs down the roof and drips down to the ground. So in this case, we're not seeing so much of an issue because of a concrete foundation. But when you think about the drip of most barns, most buildings, that drip down to the ground, that don't have a gutter to them, and I would not recommend a gutter, dripping down and then splashing back against the wall. Uh, you can see that clearly with, on the other side, you can see where that splash is indeed coming back up against the concrete wall, but if it happens to be a wood frame wall, if it happens to be planks, that's plank siding that's down that way, 
if it happens to be the structural sill that's underneath of it, they're all picking up water, moisture, insects love to live there, and decay likes to grow there, and it becomes an issue. And uh, that's one of the major areas of deterioration that I'm looking at. What's going on along the base of the building that's causing deterioration? Obviously, there are few barns that have a concrete foundation like this. Some may have a foundation that are at a lower level and may not even be seen. Or in many cases, what I'm finding are cement bricks, little piers, concrete piers, rocks, big boulders, or not so big boulders that are then attempting to hold up the building. Um, and in many cases, when that splash comes down, it, after a while, it starts creating a puddle. Or, like here, the water can't get that way anymore, so it wants to stay right here and make the soil softer underneath, almost water pockets right slower to evaporate out or to filter in through. So the softer it becomes, the more likely is that the foundation may start squishing and giving in different positions. So here's an example of that. The word here is that this occurred during an earthquake. Well, okay, but uh, because the ground started moving, ah, when the ground starts moving because the soil is soft, the same kind of situations are going to occur. And so when I'm looking at foundations in particular, uh, I'm, I'm looking to see what's going on with a crack. So the crack, a crack this way, is meaning that something happened in here. A part of the building went down or up this way. Um, or that it wanted to push out. Not the case here. When I see a diagonal crack along the way, then I'm starting to get an idea of what part of the wall is going down and what part's staying. I'm going to look at the crack itself and see where the change is taking place and see if I can understand why it happened. If there happens to be a horizontal crack, my initial reaction is run. <laughs> now I know that's not going to happen. <laughs> and for the most part, what that's meaning is that pressure is being applied against the wall because of water, usually, or heavy equipment, or other issues along the way that's pushing that, and therefore creating a crack on the inside, and, on, and that crack will often show up on the outside also. So, foundations are tricky. Every barn has to have one. Every building has to have one, a pad to, to rest on. And um, if there's any movement to that or any water accumulation, then it creates problems down the way. So let me take a pause here because I'm talking about problems. And I have to admit to you that whenever I'm looking at a building, I see a problem or a symptom. But what's registering in my head is why did that happen? What's the cause? And so often, we get all in, involved in, in a problem and forget why it happened in the first place. We fix the problem, but we don't fix the cause, and we get back to do it again. So I think that's true with everything that I'm saying here, is there's a problem, and there's a cause, and then there's a treatment of what to do about it. So what we're mainly talking about are issues or problems but keep in mind, what causes all these things to happen and is that something we should deal with? The other issue is that I think is very obvious, 
blackberries, vegetation, brushes, brush, even on the other barn of trees, and we'll look on the far side of, the, of that barn, the trees are actually, and the limbs are actually coming up to the barn itself and uh, rubbing against the, the walls. At the same time, the roots are coming underneath of the foundation and also creating issues as well, reaching for that moist area that I just talked about. So you can love trees, but love them further away from old barns and old houses. I can't tell you, say how many times I've said, remove this tree, but plant another one 50 feet further out away from the building. Just five days ago, I looked at a barn where blackberries were growing like this. It happened to be on a roof edge where the water ran down off the edge of the roof into the blackberries. Blackberries then directed the water into a major beam within the barn itself and caused major structural damage. So, uh, at the same time, it prevents light, air, sunlight from evaporating out the moisture. Get rid of the vegetation within 10 feet around a barn. We're, we're just going to take a look at uh, the side of this barn, uh, the south barn here. It has a couple things, one of which is blackberries, the other is the tree. And you can see what happens as water comes off of the roof, it lands on the leaves and the branches and just directs that water back in toward the building, toward the wall. So it, it just reinforces the need for vegetation to go away. Now, the other thing that I want you to look at, can you see how the siding is wavy here? It's wavy up and down and it's waving in and out. So that's telling me Clearly, there's some, something's happening to that wall. What, so that's the flag for me to say, go find out what the cause is. Why did it do that? But it's so important to just recognize something is not right there and what's going wrong. It may be, it doesn't need anything. It doesn't need attention. Or maybe it needs immediate attention. Well, those are the things that to, just, to just be aware of with your barn. Let's now talk about windows. And uh, not a lot, because the windows are all different in many barns. Some don't have any sash in, some do, some are irregular. These have been replaced uh, over time, so there's no real sash, it's just glass that's set into the barn itself. But the thing to look at in not only barn windows, but in your house, as a matter of fact, go around and look at the window sill and look at the bottom of the window sash and look at what's going on at the jam, the side jams of the, along the lower level because, and the trim. Because what happens, obvious, the water comes down, splashes against the, the, the sill. The sill somewhat holds that moisture there, causing it to check, causing it to deteriorate, causing moisture to migrate up along the edges and along the lower sill of the window sash and, in, and of the trim. This is a, 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 of the trim. So this is a perfect example. Not only is it accumulating dirt, debris, pollen, <laughs> but it's growing mold, holding moisture, accelerating the deterioration and there are eventually what will happen is I could grab a hold of that and just pull it right on out. So even if it's a matter of not making any repairs or making any changes, the least that could happen is just every now and then to come and clean this out. Get it clean, 
maybe even if you had a chance, if it was already painted, was to use a prime and just prime over, just do a spot paint. Uh, it's, uh, too often we wait until the whole building has to be painted. Do your, do your spot repairs, spot painting when they need it. With barns, there are doors and doors and swing doors and passenger or access doors and overhead doors and every kind of door you can imagine and everyone works a different way. But look what happens here. And this is just very obvious that water comes down and splashes. Look, it even starts eroding this concrete right here and it's splashing back. Look what happens to the jam of windows and doors, particularly when there's either in a splash area or there's concrete or a sill right nearby, is the water starts accumulating. Um, actually, the water wants to seep in between a sill and the bottom of the wood and migrate its way up into the wood, causing decay. That becomes a real dog to replace and to repair. And eventually what happens is it loses its structural ability and then everything starts going out of whack here. So um, it's an area to keep watch on and in particular to keep that, try to keep that moisture away from getting into the jams, the lower jams of windows and doors. Okay, another type of door, many types of doors, on a swing door, there's so much weight out here that it becomes an issue with not only the door, but also the pressure that it puts on this jam or the wall that's right nearby. And so when it goes out, the weight goes down, the jam actually goes in another six inches, and the whole thing is not connected because, because it rotted away just like this is rotted away. So there are issues that once you understand what's going on can be dealt with. Uh, and if not dealt with, then it becomes a real complication. Things get worse then. Uh, the, the issues I find with rolling doors like this is the hardware gets corroded and so do the rollers and then everything gets jammed. There's not an easy way of dealing with that other than just to keep them lubricated or to keep the rust or corrosion from occurring. Um, and the other is, just like we talked about before, is that when it's down in the duff like this, then it's going to start deteriorating, or it already has, or, or the splash in here is going to start coming back up against the door here. I think one of the most significant issues with barns is this water dripping off of the roof and what to do with that accumulated water. How do you, how do you deal with it? If it didn't have gutters, I wouldn't put them on. And if you had gutters, you probably won't clean them. So don't deal with gutters there. Deal with how you're going to collect that water here. One way of doing that is with stone. I use larger stone along the drip edge. Also, what I like to do is take a membrane and build a gutter in the ground when possible. I can't say it's always possible. The grade doesn't always want to cooperate with me. But when possible is to build a gutter using a pond liner or a, a, a rubber membrane in particular down 8 inches, 10 inches, 12 inches in such a way and then fill that up with crushed stone and be able to angle that so that the water can flow to and away from the building. We don't want the water to accumulate near the foundation or the footers. 
we don't we don't want the splash so think about with your barn how are you going to get that water away and how are you going to get it to flow over it's going to come no matter what so you've got to deal with it one of the other issues with barns is because the soil has so many nutrients in it all kinds of good things want to grow and grow rapidly and the root structure will kind of reinforce and hold all of that dirt together and hold that moisture together. So look at the situations that are going on along the base of the foundation or the base of your wall and how to get the water away, away, or away and no splash. Not going to be easy, but it's something you have to deal with. Okay. This so obviously we're in the loft of the south barn now. What a magnificent space. And of course, that's what a hay loft is, is space. And to, to me, what's really interesting is because almost, almost within a decade, barns changed. As soon as we had a baler, then everything changed because then we, d we didn't have to deal with loose hay from a wagon into a loft, we could bale it and put it somewhere. These days, we leave it either in the field or we wrap it in plastic and we don't have a need for a hay barn. And the other thing that happened at the same time was that we weren't using horses for energy. Mm -hmm. and, and if you don't have need for horses, then Maybe that changes what's going on in the barn also. You don't need to have a spot for them. And furthermore, on top of that, dairy farming just changed dramatically. And so all those changes really put an, sort of an end to these magnificent structures that we have dotted throughout Washington. And the reason why it's so vitally important to keep these so that people into the future will have some idea what it was like early on back in this area. So this is a perfect example of why this could and should be preserved. Okay, what I've found with some barns is that sometimes the, the, the floor rots out and a, a, then a, an owner will take the floor or flooring out. And when that happens, it takes some of the ties, the horizontal ties to the walls are not there anymore and the walls start pushing outward. Okay, so uh, looking at these rafters, so the framed wall comes up to a plate uh, uh, and then the rafters are sitting on that plate. Now, right at this location, if you happen to have a gable roof or a gambrel roof, what can happen is the outward thrust of force in here of coming out this way. Uh, what I've found is that some of rafters from the roof actually skid off or are pushed off of the plate because of that outward thrust of force. So. One of the things that I'm always looking at when I'm inside of a barn is all of the connections to make sure wherever there's a connection, are those connections coming apart? Are they pulling outward? Is there a gap between the, the two members? I'm also looking, particularly with ga gable and gambrel roof barns, for cracks because that hump in the roof that I may have discovered outside, maybe because a rafter is cracked and therefore the roof is starting to come down. One of the things that I'm wanting to do in addition to looking at open connections or connections that are pulling apart is that I'm looking for water stains or looking for leaks or possible leaks. And so I'm up here looking and seeing, well, that's looking rather suspicious right there. Of course, that leads itself to what's going on on, on the floor. 
of is there any water stains or is there any water accumulation on the floor or is it dripping or are there pockets or areas of decay or or bird poop <laughs> we're looking at a, a column a post uh, that's underneath of the loft and of course they need to be substantial because an enormous amount of weight uh, in, in a loft um, but the thing that I'm looking for uh, with each post is what's happening between the floor and the bottom of the post and is that moisture or is there moisture creeping up and starting to deteriorate the bottom of the post essentially uh, dropping the whole loft down uh, there are some times when I find it just makes sense to replace the post. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also maybe makes, uh, makes sense, instead of having the post hit directly on the concrete, is to give a little space underneath of that with, a, with like a piece of steel mm -hmm. or a bracket sometimes. Mm -hmm. But really a replacement would, be, would make sense uh, in most post situations. It's, there's nothing like a good solid piece of wood. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I didn't really talk about were the critters that are small, call them insects. And uh, the, the, the two that are of primary concern that I see in the Washington area are uh, carpenter ants and powder post beetle. The, the, the real troublemakers I'm finding are powder post beetle, and they seem to be predominant in, in, in this area. Uh, they like moisture, so do the ants, but the powder post beetle does eat the wood, and they eat just a little bit underneath of the outside surface of the wood, so that um, sometimes you don't even notice it, except for little tiny holes so that that's the giveaway is the small holes that are about a sixteenth of an inch in diameter or less and sometimes you'll see a pile of sawdust if you will a pile of wood dust that may be on the floor next to it or actually dribbling down from a timber or a piece of wood they're dangerous to the point where they can eat a, a timber to the point where there's no structural strength left to it. So um, um, it, it's something to look around and look for. Uh, if you see frass uh, along the timbers, then there's a way to deal with that. And um, that way is with a product that has a borate or borax kind of base to it. The good news is also, is that borate wants to deter fungal growth and it's safe. So I could talk for hours about barns. I just love them. There's some magnificent barns here in the state of Washington. And I think uh, the people a hundred years, 150 years from now will appreciate seeing what we have done in thinking about them at this level. And so preservation to me is really a very important thing. Little nibbling away to make sure that we're saving something for someone else. As, as you could probably tell, I've had a good time and uh, I, I really look, I always look forward to going to a barn and discovering new things and situations that are going on and in encouraging owners to think about what's going on in their barn not just with the problems but what we're causing those problems and in some cases it's just a little thing that doesn't take a lot of money and a lot of effort to do and it can really help preserve the building in the long run so think about that and uh, keep in touch with the Washington Trust and the uh, preservation of barns. Great. Um, well, we're going to get our videos 
started back up again and we've got a bunch of questions that popped into the uh, the question and answer box. So thank you all. Um, I did get some feedback that the, the video was a little pixelated. So um, just in case you're wondering, when we upload it to YouTube, we'll use the original uh, video. Uh, and so it'll upload much clearer. Um, sorry about that, that pixelation. So uh, first, I just wanna say thank you to the staff at the um, Billy Frank Jr. Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge for touring us around. Uh, they were super hospitable. And thanks again to US Fish and Wildlife, not only for allowing us to tour these barns, but of course for helping uh, put, on, put, on, put on Barn Week. So, I didn't introduce him before and I should have, but with me is Dr. Harrison Goodall here live to answer your questions about the video, which I hope you all enjoyed. Um, so Harrison, we had several questions about why no gutters, why you don't recommend gutters. And I, I know you went a little bit into it more uh, when we toured the barns, but I had to kind of edit for time. So do you wanna, um, we have, one question that says, why do you not recommend gutters? And then uh, Michael Hauser also said, why, wondering why no gutters should be added. So what do, you, what, do you have any more thoughts about that? Sure, yeah. Um, hello, hello, everyone. Um, as you can tell, I get a little excited about barn. <laughs> and, um, and, and water is always my, my issue and my problem. Actually, in heritage barns, many of them, if not most of them, had gutters and had a cistern that was right by it because that was the source of collecting water, particularly for the livestock and, uh, and a very necessary thing. But it also meant that they, need to, they needed care and they needed to be cleaned out and they needed to be operating. And what I find now is that we're not into that, taking that time to be able to do that or making those repairs on them. And when a gutter backs up, then it starts backing up and overflowing and coming down the walls. So, um, yeah, one of which is to retain the character of the building of what it looked like at one time or another. If the gutters are off, I don't think I would put the gutters back on again. I've found much more success by just building the gutter right within, or let, let's just say I'm dealing with the water and directing it away from the building at the ground level rather than at the edge of the roof. Great. Um, we also had a question about how to deal with water splash when there's a concrete slab next to a wall or door. And again, I will admit he did talk about this when we, <laughs> when we were on site, but again, it got trimmed out of the video for, for length. So um, any uh, quick recommendations on slabs, outdoor slabs that contribute to water splash? We're not likely to move the slabs. Um, the, the, the splash is still gonna take place. And uh, I don't, I'm a little embarrassed even by saying this, is, but that I do interfere with the character of the roof a little bit by taking a piece of, uh, a piece of angle. And here we go. I take a, a little piece of angle, uh, usually of aluminum or um, galvanized, and then just tuck a little piece of this up under a sh shingle or if I can, if it's available. If it's a metal roof, then it's a little bit more of an issue. But by just making a little lift so that water then might slide down and then drift and, and at an angle and then run off. That doesn't always work where there's ice and snow, but then in the Northwest, we're not doing that that much. But yeah, on nice. the other side of the hill, um, that could be a, a factor and it may not work. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you're right. It, it would interfere slightly with the look of the roof line, but it's a small piece, it's reversible, and it could go a long way towards saving a whole wall and door frame and everything. And so I think that that's a it's, pretty- It's possible to blend it in, but the, 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 without it, it, that splash is just going to impact the whole door structure. Yep, exactly. We also had a question about the, the baler that you mentioned and um, someone wondering about what year the baler was invented, if you 
know off the top of your head? No, I don't know off the top of my head, but I think it was, I, I, I think the invention of it was somewhere in the teens, give or take a decade or so. Yeah. But it, it wasn't until uh, the 30s that they became um, um, available, and particularly in the West Coast. Uh, but also uh, that they became something that a farmer could uh, could acquire and could use. Mm -hmm. So it, it took uh, 20, 30, 40 years or so for that transition from loose hay into baled hay. And, uh, and, and what I found uh, in some places is that farmers were wanting to put baled hay into their loft because that's where the loft was and that's what you do with, with hay, except that it's nine times heavier than loose hay and that would cause all kinds of structural problems with a barn loft. Yeah, absolutely. I've um, got a few questions that I'm going to pull out of the chat area. We had someone asking about the um, borate or borax um, products and asking for some specific recommendations if you have any specific products. Uh, or <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I can suspect, and this could, this could be a whole session, right, in itself yeah. <laughs> of, of, of dealing with this. Um, a, a borate wants, uh, there are a lot of reasons for wanting to deal with borate. Could I just suggest that you Google on, on borate, but also on um, some products, not that I'm suggesting them, but one is Timbor and one is Boracare. And if you uh, Google on Timbor and Boracare, it will give you all kinds of information about what it is, how it does it, and essentially, I've been using it for about 35 years, and it works. Um, and it is non-toxic and non-toxic to animals. So it's um, um, an option for slowing down decay and making little critters, uh, insects go away. Great. Okay, we have one question, another question in the chat. Um, Joanne says, I've heard that the diagonal boards or Z shape on the outside of a sliding barn door can collect water and that traditionally those supporting pieces were put on the inside surface of the wide doors. Is that true? I'm not totally sure. I'm drawing a blank one on uh, visually on yeah. what that means. Question's not totally sure. Oh, and Michael Hauser has chimed in oh, my. Uh, to, about the Baylor question. So he okay. says, um, in 1936, uh, Innes invented an automatic Baylor that tied bales with twine. Yep. Um, and in 1938, Edwin Nolt filed a patent uh, for an improved version. So yeah, it was a slightly later, um, of the earlier part of the, the century. Um, but as I think Harrison rightly said, it, those types of uh, <laughs> inventions do take some time to catch on uh, in the wider, uh, the wider world of, of farming. So um, I, we are getting up on time. So I, I wanted to actually end with the first question that popped up. I, uh, Wayne, I didn't forget you. I just was saving you for the end. And he says he's got a heritage barn in Monroe that needs a new roof and asking if you would be able to come out and look at his barn and give him an analysis of his barn. So um, I just wanted to let everybody know that Harrison is uh, our statewide, but also nationally renowned barn expert. And he uh, definitely um, does go around uh, and, and consults all over the state. Um, uh, additionally, for our grant program, a lot of people um, uh, hire him to come out, but also um, additionally, uh, just as and, and he teaches with the National Park Service. So I, do, I did have his uh, email address on the slide, but we'll also send it out uh, to folks. But um, Harrison uh, gets real excited to come out and <laughs> visit barns and, get, and analyze them. So I think he would be more than happy to. I'm a softy with barns. <laughs> All right, well, um, we, yeah, we are getting close to the hour. So um, I um, 
am going to go ahead and, and wrap it up. But if, if there are any more, uh, more questions that came up, um, feel free to email us or email Harrison. We'll, we'll include his email address in the follow-up uh, for this session. Um, so thank you to Harrison for not only filming last week, but joining us today live to answer some of those additional questions and also to U.S. Fish and Wildlife for um, again letting us tour these beautiful twin barns but also for helping uh put on this whole barn week so we hope everyone enjoyed today's tour did you want to have a another comment harrison i, I have one comment is yeah. let's all just think about what we're leaving for the generations that follow us um Absolutely. And, and that means that it's not the farmer's responsibility to pay and or to take care of that barn but it's all of us that uh, that somehow or another play a part in this uh, keeping the preservation going. Yeah, thank you. Thank Absol you all. Absolutely, and and I will just say that's part of the motivation for the grant program um, is that uh, preserving historic barns and preserving the rural landscape is a public benefit, um, not only for the the landscape, but as as Harrison mentioned, um, just surviving uh, resources into the future. So we hope everyone enjoyed uh, the video. And as I said, we'll, um, we'll, this will be on YouTube and we'll upload the original video. So maybe you can see some of those details a little bit better if it was pixelated for you. Don't forget to uh, join us on, on Facebook and Instagram for trivia and featured barns of the day. Um, we are at Preservoi and you can also tag us at Preservoi and tag hashtag Barn Week uh, to share your own content that we'd love to, to share out. It's not too late to share your own photos uh, on social media so definitely keep those coming. And just one more reminder about the Heritage Barn email list which is where we send out all things barns um, uh, grants, salvage material, all that stuff. So that link will also be in the chat. And then finally, if you enjoyed today's programming, please do consider becoming a member of the Washington Trust. We are a, a nonprofit membership organization. Um, and in addition to Barn Week and managing the grant program, uh, we offer a wide range of other opportunities to get involved with preservation, including uh, public advocacy, educational education and networking, uh, and other virtual events like this one. So we'll also put a link in the chat box to uh, our membership page. So please consider joining and supporting our work as, as a nonprofit. So thank you again for everyone who joined us this week we'll continue the fun on our social media accounts today we'll have a few more things to post tomorrow but this is our last uh noon uh virtual event so thank you everyone uh, and thank you harrison for uh for joining us and we'll go ahead and say goodbye for today but it's not over our love of barns is going to continue uh past barn week and of course we'll keep you posted on um on everything with with our emails and and social media and communication so thanks for the opportunity thanks everyone bye